Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Hi. And I'm Quentin Smith. Here from Shut Up and Sit Down, welcome to the show. Uh, we are intimidated by their hugeness of size, and that's why we only invited one person from Shut Up and Sit Down, <laughs> so that me and Z could handle it. That's right. Yeah, without backup as well, I'm uh, I'm very nervous. I think invite. I, I was hoping that you'd invite, you know, two or three of us, but I'm I'm alone. I'm separated. I'm scared. Uh, this is a scouting party. Right. Um, we'll, we'll yeah, I suddenly feel piece. like a pack. I feel like a pack hunter all of a sudden. This is very strange. <laughs> well, don't worry. Z. If it makes you feel better, I promise to insult you as much as possible over the course of today. So business as usual. I got it. Well, what I meant was that wasn't going to just be during this top 10. During the phone call afterwards, yeah. various <laughs> points over the course I, of the night. I got, Tom, I've, I've worked here for a while. I got it. <laughs> yeah. I know how this goes. All righty. Well, today is uh, – so we, we are, I have a plethora of top 10 topics that I send to different people. And so we are blaming today's topic's choice on Quinn's for picking it, even though he did give me four options. Um, <laughs> oh, that's big of you to admit. <laughs> so unique games. This is a interesting one because I'm constantly, I'll play a game and I'll go, that was really unique. And then I immediately forget about it later on when it's well, time to make a top 10 list. I was, you know, obviously very excited to like not embarrass, well, <laughs> I was excited to not embarrass myself uh, on this top 10, but immediately ran into a difficulty because the, t the category is top 10 unique games. But I still haven't got an answer from either of you on, is this the 10 games that are the most unique or is this the best unique games or both? And I'll tell you right now, I, I'm too much of a coward to commit to either of those. So I just went with most unique and that I like the most. And if my list is weird, that's why. Yes. How did you order them? Uh, from from the ones I don't know I, I think I these are 10 games that I like but I think I no no I, I ordered them by how much I like them that's the only true answer okay well that's what I did I picked 10 very unique games oh wait you're not allowed to say that are you very very 10. unique yeah that's that's a no-no but apparently I can uh, get away with saying most unique <laughs> so I, I don't know what the rules are here but I like the rule where Tom is wrong and I'm right yeah, but I'm agreeing with you. I picked unique games, and I also ordered them from how much I like them from top, from bottom to top. How unique would you say they are, though? I would say they are almost super unique. <laughs> Here's the <laughs> thing. <laughs> unique has been ruined. Judges? And it's, in, it's in the dictionary now. Unique does not need to mean one of a kind. There could be more than one of something, and it's still unique. Okay. I, 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 I'm looking it up. I ranked these. Uh, well, the first thing I tried to do was not put so many kids games on the list because kids games tend to be a little bit weirder and more outside of the box. I largely failed at that. There's a bunch of kids games on here. And then I also <laughs> just put near the top of the list how just sort of how far from center they are, I guess. You know, how much I enjoy playing them, sure, but they've been around for a while and no one's really made anything quite like them again sometimes. I don't know. They're ranked numerically there. Uh, I, what's what's the uh, over-under on crossovers? Maybe we might have a couple of crossovers among all of us, but I, I just don't see a lot of that happening. I'm going to like do one of those sort of trick-taking bidding type things now i bet three games from my list will be on either of your two lists i'll go with three okay i'm gonna say two from mine i'm gonna go with that uh, i got two two that's already me. taken <laughs> well no it's possible is that possible that we could yeah, all be yeah. right oh no wait yeah no. hang on maybe Maybe I don't know. There's three way ties, right? <laughs> that could be a game that's. Yeah, the three way tie. Someone, that's what we need. We need someone who has any kind of grasp of basic mathematics to help us out here. All righty. Well, let's get started. I, I'm, I'm very curious what you all picked. Here we go. Mm. 
number 10. All right, my number 10 pick here is, speaking of trick-taking games, is a trick-taking game. And it's a fairly recent one called Nokosu Dice. This is a trick-taking game that has both cards and dice in it. And at the beginning of each hand, you roll out, sort of spill out a whole bunch of dice, and then you draft them around the table. You also deal everyone a hand of cards. And these dice, you can play into a trick as though they were a card from your hand. The dice are colored, so when it's my turn to follow and you led purple, I could play my purple five from my hand, or I could play a, a purple three on a die in front of me. I can just put that into the table. The trick is, <laughs> you have... Um, <laughs> terrible. The, the, the deal bad. is you have one more die than you will play. So you're going to hold one back, okay? And the one you hold back at the very end of the entire hand, if you score that many tricks, I think it is, then you get a bonus. So it's like one of those bidding trick-taking games, but you don't have to settle on a number until the hand kind of gets going. Does that make sense? And I really like that about it. Because I hate those bidding games. They're so punishing. People who are good at, it, at them will just be good at them, and they will just crush the table. They can look at their hand and go, I'm going to take three tricks. And they do, somehow. I can never predict that stuff. But with this, if I have a bunch of different dice values, you know, it might be three, it might be four. I just have to make sure I hold that die back. And that's the last one. Uh, I think it's neat. It plays uh, It plays really well. It doesn't scale very well. You want to play with four, pretty much. But that's true for a bunch of trick-taking games. Anyway, Nokosu Dice is my number 10 pick. I'll well, start was... by picking a game nobody's heard of. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll continue to do that. I wanted to make fun of you there because, you know, for your first unique game, you started a sentence trick-taking. And it's like, well, of course, there's not many trick-taking games out there. But, you know, by the end, I was sold on this game that I also have not heard of. It's uh, cool. <laughs> my number Has 10. anyone ever reviewed this even? I reviewed it. I don't, I don't watch those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My number 10 is a little game, another game that you two haven't heard of, but uh, it's pretty big. It's a game called uh, Root. Now, you two are wondering, what's this game called Root? Well, let me tell you, this is a game <laughs> that is- Tell me more. Well, so look, listen, let me explain my thinking when I talk about Root, the uh, famously asymmetric war game of woodland creatures uh, battling one another. So Root to me, obviously, I mean, it's it's like a coin game. And you would say it's not unique because it's a coin game. It's, it's asymmetric sides. But first off, coin games don't see sides using different, uh, the breadth of different mechanics on offer in Root, uh, you know, is not something you see in coin games. But more importantly, Root isn't just a unique sort of game design. Root is a unique theme as well. I mean, there's the reason that for Root's success is not that it's an asymmetric war game. We've had those before. It's it's the combination of uh, a insanely off-putting set of mechanics with a theme that is extremely unusual and standout um, and cute for what it's worth. Um, so and also, like I said, I designed this list with the idea of games that were unique that I actually also you know, really like. Now, I'm not going to say that Root is a better game than, I'm sorry, Z, what was the name of your game? No, forget it. I'm not repeating Okay, <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. It's lost to time. I feel deep shame when you come at us with Root and I'm over here talking about some dinky little dice game. Hey, let me tell you, my list only gets less Heavier. niche from there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I actually considered putting Root on my list. I And then I was afraid... Because those, I was afraid the grognards would show up and shake sticks at me and chat about coin games and Root wasn't very original. And then I would say, but what about the animals? And then go weep in the corner. And then I you wasn't remembered sure. they're not going to be watching this. <laughs> yeah, that's a truth of it. I will say, you know, as far as coin games goes, there's, I mean, I've played a couple of coin games. I've not seen anything like uh, the Bird Faction, the Eerie. I've not seen anything like the, um, oh, I always call them otters, but they are, no. I call them beavers in the review, but they were otters. You know, there's a there's a whole load of fascinating, unique stuff happening in Root, and I and that's before we even get to the stuff in the latest expansion or whatever expansions that come next. That's it. Num my number ten Root is a good idea, not for the game, but for all the expansions that haven't come out yet that will make it even more unique. Nice. Well, I think that was a fine first choice, yeah, and we're going to say lots of good things. 
just in case we need to take it back later, you had a good entrance. Nice. All right, my number 10 is a game that, again, I ordered these from my least favorite to favorite. This one I wanted to like more because the story behind it is so good, and that's Nyctophobia. Mm. And Nyctophobia, which is a game that uh, was made because the designer had a relative who had trouble seeing, and she wanted to make a game that this person could play uh, being with, with some uh, seeing impairment. And so that's what this game is. You, Most of the people who are playing the game are blindfolded, and you are just feeling your way around, and you're running from a serial killer or some evil guy trying to kill you, and you're feeling your way through a forest. It is not a game you should play right now, uh, mostly because the one person has to hold the other person's hands consistently throughout the game. Uh, but, and it's, it has a few fundamental flaws in that the person who is the bad guy has to play, I think, a little bit more like a dungeon master than a, I'm going to beat everybody at the game because they could just win, I think. But that does a good job at making you feel like you're lost in the forest to some degree and there's a guy breathing down your neck about to kill you. I think I think one of the people's a vampire, but one's a serial killer. Either way, which one's worse? The I, vampire. I, I don't know. I'm going to go a serial killer. <laughs> you know, I was not expecting to get hit with that question, Tom. That's really well. No, I, I, you know, I just it just occurred to me like, which one would I? I think I'd th I think I'd rather have the vampire because maybe he has some weird code. But um, oh, a vampire anyway. is just a predator. A vampire has to eat you. A serial killer is is bad news. Bad news bears. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I think this one's extremely unique. There's nothing else like it, as far as I can tell. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you played this one, Z? Nope. Nope. I haven't played it. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it. I'm familiar with it. And I agree. I mean, it seems really different. I did play it. And uh, Tom, the moment you described where if you're the uh, the murderer or vampire, you have to touch everyone's hands to move their hands onto the board. Um, I don't have clammy hands particularly, but I don't know what it was. As soon as I was assigned that role, my hands got so moist <laughs> and all of my friends <laughs> made fun of me. So much because it's like, oh, this moist hand murder of putting their hand on the board again. So that's my main defining memory of Nyctophobia. Well, back in Victorian ages, this game would have gone over really well, you know, because it'd been like, I'm touching her hand. Ooh. And it would have been it would have been banned probably. It would have been only point. only sold in the, the backs of various stores. You'd have to come in and say a code and they'd be like, Nyctophobia, yes, this way. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's my number ten. Number nine. My number nine is a children's game that I, while not being a child, owned for several years. This is a game called Truffle Snuffle. And in it, it's from Hava, by the way. It's a Hava game. I'm it comes this. with a a pig nose on a on a uh, an elastic band. You're gonna put that on your face. Within the snout is a magnet. You spread out tokens <laughs> on a bowl on the table, face down. You have a sand timer, <laughs> and once that sand timer begins, you are going to touch the snout to these pieces, which attach to it magnetically. You will then hover your nose, your snout, over a mirror that comes included. See what the token is, because you, you're now you're looking at the other side. And, and then take it off of the nose into the box of the game. You put it in one compartment. If it's a one you're looking for, you put it in a different compartment if it's one you're not looking for. You think you got the mental image, right? That's oh, what I the went game and looked is. the picture up online. So did I, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah so you never told me you owned this game. I used to own it. I, I owned it many years ago uh, for, a, for a while, too. And I, I used to play with my, well, he was little then, my nephew. And it's just, I mean, immediately you put this thing on your face and you're, of course, laughing. And then you start playing and you start getting frenetic with it. And sometimes you're trying to get this thing off of the pig's snout and it's not, not working. Um, it's just, a, a, it's really stupid. It's completely ridiculous. It's also a lot of laughs. And it certainly is different. I, I haven't come across anything quite like it, and um, so I figured it deserved a spot on the list. It's not very high on the list because, I again, it's a kid's game. 
and there will be others that are also kids games this isn't gonna have you know it's not gonna go the distance it's not gonna have legs but uh but it's fun truffle snuffle that is two games in a row i haven't heard of that is very impressive I can't believe now if someone were to say, uh, hey, Quince, you know that truffle game? I would say, oh, do you mean truffle shuffle or truffle snuffle? Like, that's a real <laughs> sentence I yeah, might have to say a, now. A... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry for that. It's, yeah, you've made my life worse. Okay, my number nine, and this is, goodness me, did Z and I have different ideas of what this list should be. My number nine, and I could have put any Splatter game on this list, really, because if there's one, th I mean, I think Splatter more than any other publisher are defined by publishing things that are absolutely bizarre and unique. And, and you know, I could have named something like The Great Zimbabwe or, or Roads and Boats, but I chose Food Chain Magnate. Um, because not because I think it's necessarily the most it is like um, the most unique splatter game, but it is my favorite, and that is something I wanted to incorporate. Food Chain Magnate is a ve quite heavy game of running competing fast food chains in the fifties, um, which has two. I mean, fulfilling orders of food is what you're trying to do, but that's obfuscated by two very difficult and confusing systems. The first of which is you have to market food first, because in a kind of dark statement on consumerism. Nobody actually wants anything you're buying until you force them to want it first. But marketing on a sort of this area control map of a city is something that any player can do. But once you've infused the desire of burgers or cola into the people that live there, um, anyone can fulfill that desire based on how close their restaurant is and how cheap your prices are. And then the way you uh, sort of run your business is by hiring staff and you create an actual management pyramid out of cards, which are your employees. It starts with you as the top and then you can hire other people who can recruit other people who can train staff and make food and build restaurants and even build buildings and you can get into property development. And there's so much about this game that I think makes it unique. But the reason it's on my list is because it is so unique and easily in my top 50 games of all time. Wow. I, ahead, I can't Tom. disagree with a lot of what you said about the top, except maybe the top 50. I would argue it's certainly unique in the fact that they managed to make some parts of it look so good and the other parts look so bad. A nice, you know, cross juncture. And also this game is unique and I don't believe I've ever lost a game so badly in my life. It is. I mean, it's a splatter game, right? What do they joke about that? Um, if you can't lose a splatter game on the first turn, then it's not actually a splatter game. You must be playing something else. <laughs> That's. Very reasonable, I, uh, I think. I mean, I think it's the opposite of reasonable. It. I'm just delivering it in a British that. accent, which makes it sound uh, different. All right, my number nine is, well, I'm jumping back into weird territory here. This is a game that is extremely fragile. And if you're playing this, you don't want anyone else near the game. And that's polarity. I don't know if you've played this one, Z. Yeah, 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 with the magnets uh, sort yeah, of so polarity, keeping each other in check, yeah. Polarity is a bunch of magnets that look like uh, Othello pieces, mm -hmm. white and black sides. And you are, in this game, you need to balance these around the board so that they are sitting somewhat on a table but hovering in the magnetic fields of the other pieces. So you're placing them in such a way that they'll sit there and they're kind of leaning. And it's, it's kind of cool and it's neat until an oaf walks by <laughs> and jostles the table and every single magnet snaps together. Yeah, which has happened in more. I would say it probably happens in more than 50 percent of all polarity games in existence <laughs> um, <laughs> or even not just someone walking by the table. But you just you move one piece and then it's not like a couple magnets snap together. It's just this chain reaction of horror. But it is different. I I I find it amusing and I would gladly play this probably once every three or four years as a as a lark, because I don't think the. The uniqueness of it is strong enough to counteract the just the being a pain. It has to be like perfect sync. The world has to be rotating the right direction. Maybe maybe you like it more than me, Z. No, I don't think so. I, I agree that I that it's extremely unique, though. I it is they fact they've got that one other magnet game that that uh, R and R came out with where you would throw them on the table. Yeah. Remember that? But that was that's sort that's of just you can... hearts, right? Like love. No, there's a there's another version attraction, of it. Attraction, I think is... it's called attraction, right? Yeah, Something where the magnets like are shaped like hearts, but I've seen it in its vanilla oh, okay. form as well. But I haven't it's played basically. 
yeah, it's just, you know, that one is very simple. You just throw them, try to catch them. But yeah, the, the one you're talking about is a sort of exercise in finesse that doesn't really work. But even the attempt is so distinct that I think is cool. Can we all agree that a game, here finding out that a game will feature magnets is like generally a good feeling? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, it really okay. is. That, <laughs> I, we, I was thinking about this the other day, Coloma has a magnet spinner in the middle that it just holds the thing there. And I think I gave it a whole extra point for it. <laughs> I, 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 if you put a magnet in food chain magnet and call wow. it food chain magnet, I would wow. probably give it an extra point. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's just not even that. That's I'm just I'm reeling. That was good. I didn't even mean for that to happen. Oh, I've been I will retire right now. My number nine, Polaris. <laughs> yeah, let's finish the list first. Number eight. My number eight is also a kids game. The copy of this I have is no longer in print, but they reprinted recently. With the theme from Ice Cool, this is called, in a tree print, the terrible Pyramid of Peng Queen. <laughs> that's is, true. I hate so much. I was talking about magnets. Uh, that's right, exactly. Uh, the one I have is called Curse of the Mummy, which is, uh, or in, Ger in German, anyway. But it, that's, what it, that's what it means, Curse of the Mummy. I, I really like this game. Yeah, it's got a, a board that you set between uh, the one player playing the mummy and the other players. It is magnetic. You are attaching magnets on on uh, your side. You'll have the mummy piece. On the other side are all the explorers trying to get in this pyramid, steal whatever, get out. And then you'll move your piece trying to capture them. You have a matching piece on the other side so that the players, this is the coolest part, the players who are trying to get in, rob the stuff and get out, will see your ghostly figure moving around seemingly on its own on the on the board and so they can kind of you know see you moving towards them and then uh, here comes a bend and are they going to keep coming towards me or take that left turn oof okay they turned i really find this game fascinating yes it's a super light game it's silly but it's extremely replayable too this is not like polarity this is not like truffle uh truffle snuffle this is Something I can definitely bring out right now and play. Whoa, and whoa, whoa. You're saying this is better than Truffle Snuffle? I am saying it's at least one better than whoa. Truffle ah! Snuffle. See, I've played this and I haven't played Truffle Snuffle, but I feel like Truffle Snuffle is a game I would remember the rest of my life. Mm. I have memories I can't quite wash away that involve <laughs> Truffle Snuffle. And I've tried. I've tried to wash them away, but they... Uh, they stain me like uh, I'm so this stop. was also um, in the back of that store that was selling games. Yeah, I guess got so. it. Anyway, no, I like I like uh, Curse of the Mummy quite a bit. I think it's a really just fun, engaging game. Haven't seen anything like it, and they keep reprinting this thing, which is a a, a good sign, I think. So I, yeah, uh, that's my number eight. This has been actually uh, something that I wanted to play for a long time, Z. So I'm glad you're mentioning it and jog my memory because there will be that convention where I play it. Uh, for my number eight, yeah. I'm sticking with, uh, just like I had with my number 10, Roots, um, games that pack a lot of ideas, a lot of uniqueness into one box. So this is a social deduction game that I think anyone who's even played social deduction games to death would agree that this is a unique game within the genre. I am talking, of course, not of course, but I'm talking about Two rooms and a boom. A, oh, Tom's really? pulled a face. Tom, Tom, so talk to me. I thought you were going to mention... I thought oh, you Blood on the Clock Tower? Blood on okay, the Clock no, Tower. Ah, well, I could, of course. But um, he, I, I, And I love Blood on the Clock Tower. I will happily... Uh, well, slightly unhappily, considering the controversy. But it is still my number one game of all time, is Blood on the Clock Tower. But it's not a unique game. Because Blood on the Clock Tower, to me, is an evolution of Werewolf. And that was actually a lot of people's criticism with my review. Two rooms and a boom is not something that becomes invalidated by evolutions on, you know, werewolf or evolutions on the resistance of secret Hitler. Two rooms in a boom is, is, I mean, you, you play it on your feet. It's got a marvelous physicality to do with slowly revealing cards using your fingers. It's, it, it, 
I mean, it's, I'll use the phrase that Z used earlier. It's a game that you end up remembering for the rest of your life. I mean, it, it, I've now played it to death, but it made such an impact on me at the time that not just the game itself um, being feeling unique and different, but tons of mechanics within the game itself, you know, mm -hmm. um, some stuff that's been cribbed from Werewolf, but to look through even just the cards that are just in the core set of Two, room, of two Rooms and a Boom, there's plenty of ideas that I'd not seen there before. I mean, I remember um, uh, the, one of the first times I played it, Colby Dow, um, founder of Plaid Hat Games, um, receiving a card that said he could not talk for the entire game, which is not something I have seen in Werewolf. Uh, and also in that game, cards saying that players had to smile all the time, which seems silly until you realize that players who are smiling and have to smile then lets you know that that must be the role they have, which means that other person who's smiling in the other room can't be a clown. They have to be something else. They're lying for some reason. It's just utterly unique. They That's could still be a clown, but I mean, they can and they, and yeah, anyway, um, two rooms in a boom, a game of endless permutations, all of which feel very unique. That is my number eight. Hmm. I only played this the one time and I, it felt a little sort of trite. I, the whole, like, I'll show you a card. You show me a card. Not a whole lot was happening, so I wonder if it just if I just happened to have one experience that didn't quite go that well. It's possible. It. Um, yeah. it also uh, the core game um, is if you just played it at its simplest, which is how a lot of players are introduced and how you might have been introduced, see, is quite simple and quite solvable. And I mean, solvable depending on how your game goes, right. and often can come down to a coin toss. Um, but it's only once you've been introduced to the game and all the mechanics that they start introducing all sorts of other cards that just jimmy the game uh, up, messing it up more and more and more and more and more. So I would say that if you get another chance to play it with some ex with an experienced group, you might have a very different experience. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it cool. is a game that's that that changes as time goes by. I, I feel like you have to play it a couple times before you even really know what's going on. And if, what is that if not a unique game? Eh? Eh? And I no, no, agree. we got your back. We're, we're not arguing. I agree that among other social deduction games, this one is, this one stands out. The whole, I mean, moving around, like you said, going I to mean, a different how, space. That's, that's maybe, different. see, I talked for ages and it was, and I, I used all these words. I could have just said, how many board games do you know that require two rooms? <laughs> well, there's also Twilight Imperium, but yes. No, that's yes, two, tables. Right. two tables. You're right. My apologies. My number eight is one of the ones I suspect I'm crossing over with Z, if only for the fact that we were talking the other day nope. and Mike mentioned it and I was trying to tell Mike to shut up. Nope. But I'm call that is garbage on this. Go ahead. Mord M. Arosa. This. <laughs> yeah. So this is a game in which it uses hearing. Well, it pretends to use hearing. It actually doesn't work. Um, but you stack <laughs> a bunch of. No, no, don't even pretend, Z. I get That's it wrong true. every single time. Maybe I just don't have good hearing. But you You're have all these pyramid of boxes stacked on top of each other, and you drop cubes in there, and they will likely land either on the table or in one of the floors, and then you're just trying to, as the game goes by, you're guessing which floors have cubes on. And it has something to do with a murder mystery. Someone's been murdered on one of the floors. Um, you're trying but, to shift the blame, I think is what it is, right? You're trying to make sure that when you do lift up one of these places, your cubes aren't there, and they blame someone else for the murder. Oh, I think yes, literally yes. everybody at the table has this, committed a murder. I don't if know. I saw, I'm looking at a picture now. If I saw this at a con in 2020, I would be like, I'm going straight to that table. This looks awesome. But you're telling it me does, it doesn't work? A con is the worst place to play it because you drop the cube and no one can hear anything. There's okay. like, and you have to also play it on a table with a tablecloth because sometimes you drop a cube and if you play on a wooden table and you hear this clunk on the table, you're like, well, I know that one went all the way to the bottom. I think my favorite memory of this game is actually playing this with my mom on a glass table that she used to own. And it was... We were just laughing so much because, you know, I, I would drop one or she would draw one, uh, drop one and it would go cling, 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 cling. like, I mean, just the glass would reverberate so much. And we would just sort of look at each other and just bust out laughing because it was so painfully apparent that that went right through. didn't stop anywhere. So Did, no, I, I think that, it, it sort of works, Tom. This is, this is a good one. It's a fun game. It works. It's fun. I, I It is fun. I don't know that I would ever like try to pick some unique strategy to play it i would just but it, you're right the first time i saw this quins i wanted it just yeah. because of how it looked for no other reason 
Um, and it's a decently fun game, but it's just it's it's super silly. But there's nothing like it. Seven. My number seven is a game called Witness that is basically Witness. The, the telephone game meets puzzle solving in which you have four people. It has to be four. I don't know if you guys have played this. Tom, you played this. Twins, have. have you played this? I have reviewed this. I love this game. Yeah. And so it's that. It's, you know, you have four people at the table. Everybody has part of a puzzle, basically. Like, so-and-so has this kind of mustache, and somebody slapped somebody else, and they saw in the darkness that they had no mustache, but they had a funny hat. <laughs> and uh, this guy yeah, over here how... likes to wear hats. That makes sense? And so you're, like, whispering to the next guy the little bit that you know from your booklet. <laughs> Jeff has a stupid hat. And then they go, okay, great. All right. And so now they say to the next player, their own piece and whatever you passed. Jeff has a stupid hat and only wears one shoe. You're like, all right, cool. And so eventually, once you've passed it all the way around, you answer some questions and see how well you did. It's a cooperative game. It's so weird. It's so weird. It's this, like, it's those little puzzles that you would get in, like, an activity book cut up into four pieces and then whispered around the table. So it's, uh, see, because I love this game. This is this is the first game I feel like I've failed because this should be on my list. If I'd, if I'd remembered it, it would be on my list. I think it's amazing. But I would give the puzzle design a little more credit than it's just cut up into four pieces because my group played that, like, if you go to the like the, the very back, the hardest puzzles, yeah, 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 yeah. it's all specifically stuff to trick up your memory. Like, yeah. it, if it's like, you know, he has a stupid hat, it's like, Oh, God, you know, one of you might have written down, you know, oh, well, this vintage of wine came in, was was bottled in 1942. And then someone else hears this vintage of wine was drunk in 1945 to mean that when you're playing the telephone game, you give the wrong information or you change the grammar. And then people are just passing nonsense yes. onto one another because someone messed up the game of telephone early. I love this game. No, I agree. I'm not trying to deny the designer any credit. I think it's a brilliantly put together game. Um, I just mean that that's sort of how that feels, especially when I when you first discover it, you go, wait, what? They combined what and what? That's that's what's so interesting and bizarre about it. I remember I I got a demo of this at some convention and I was immediately hooked and they they were moving us along, too. So they kind of like, you know, showed you it and, and moved you along. And I, I didn't want to go. I was like, no, no, give me another one. I want to do another one. <laughs> They're so weird. It's so, so interesting. So, yeah, Witness, my number seven. Uh, I was so enjoying that that I, I was stalled. Okay, my number seven is, let's see if you two, let's see if, I feel like my games have come from really left field so far. Monopoly. It's, yeah, it's a Pandemic. little game called Monopoly. Oh, right, shut up. It is a game, it's a team game for eight players with a screen. It's Captain Sonar. It, uh, so this, I think, you know, whatever you think about Captain Sonar, you know, it's, it's horrible at conventions because you can't hear, you know, it's, you know, it, it's maybe not that much fun. It's certainly not much fun if your team is outclassed by the other team. But in terms of uniqueness, oh, baby, Captain Sonar's got you. So this is a game of submarine combat in which you've got four roles. The captain has a map in which you draw like a game of snake, the path of your submarine, but it can't cross over itself. So, but then the captain, whenever the ship moves, has to announce, you know, going north, going east. Now, on the other team, or on both teams, there's a sonar operator whose job is to listen to the other captain and then right. draw listen. the markings that the captain, that the other captain announces on a sheet of acetate. And then eventually you'll have a long enough snake showing where the other team's moved that you can slide that around the map, which has islands on, to reveal, well, the only place this acetate can go is here. Therefore, they have to be here. And then you let the weapons officer know who's been priming torpedoes. And may or, you may or may not be having fun during this process. Games of Captain Sonar vary massively. But when you've got two full teams that are enjoying themselves uh, and are yeah. evenly matched, it's absolutely superb. So that is my number seven, Captain Sonar. Yes, 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 yes. All the shouting, all the energy. This game has one of the you know, top ten energies out there. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. for a game sort of producing this frenetic 
vibe among the players. Oh man, it's at the top of that list. You know the um the they did an expansion called like the upgrade pack, which I don't think is great. But there's another expansion which I'm hoping to get to finally next year called like Operation Dragon, which is the campaign expansion. But the first mission in that has one of the cutest things I've seen, which is both teams start with just their captain and the rest of their crew is told to sit elsewhere in the room or the house because in the story, the submarines have found one another by accident. So they're not battle ready, which means the game starts with the captains having to choose which members of the crew they wake up. So by getting the submarine to certain points on the map, you're then allowed to wake up one person. So you go, oh, I'll have the sonar operator. I'll have the weapons officer. And then slowly over the course of 20 minutes, you wake up your whole team, um, uh -huh. but in an asymmetric fashion. Wait, this cool. is actually an, a real thing? Hang on. Or is it a fan base thing? It's a real thing, Tom. That is a real well, this thing. Is, hang on, this is live. I'm seeing something. Geraldo's going into the closet. Operation Dragon. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I received it years ago, and it's too, it's <laughs> this is kind of my reviewer equivalent of a shelf of shame. It's much too cool for me to get rid of it from my cupboard, but I've not found the space on Shuttle to sit down to cover it yet. But I'm hoping to finally get to it next year. That's cool. Uh, I must play that. All right. Cool. All right. Here's the one I'm not 100% sure on. So this is a game that most people have not played. It was a Kickstarter, I believe, called Warband Against the Darkness. Um, this is okay. sort of a Euro. Uh, you are loaded. Everyone is on the same side. You're all fighting against somebody, but you have these different soldiers, these fantasy soldiers that you are playing out and you're trying to get the most glory. I put this one down as unique because I never played a game that had a very, it has a super semi co-op theme, but it's not semi co-op. But you are constantly trying to upgrade your soldiers and downgrade others. This one just felt so different than other games that I still think about it now. Um... Uh, there's nothing like it's not there's no pig nose in it and then, um then it's on the wrong list isn't it and Get there's out no of here magnets <laughs> but it's such a unique interesting game that felt different like a little bit of area control but this whole let's work together to stop the enemy i really like this one it's it's very intriguing um don't go by the cover not a great cover and the, the the game actually also looks super boring, but it's it's fun. So that's Warband Against the Darkness. Mm. Is there ever like one that's against the light? There, that's always like you're fighting darkness or something. Okay, it's against the spirit of this list, that's for sure. <laughs> oh wow! Number six. All right, Tom, you know this is going to be on my list. You know what it is. It's from Hava. It's a big box. It's about $150 probably right now. And it is a single worst idea for a game you can possibly play in the world we live in today. This is Trotafont, a game in which you stick a party favor in your mouth and breathe on other people. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play this, kids. This one has a giant rotating, like, I mean, it's got a, it takes a battery. It's this giant cardboard rotating tree that you put in the center of the table. Everybody has a party favor in their mouth, which is supposed to be the trunk of your elephant. I guess in this scenario, you are the elephant. And you are going to blow this thing out, curl up a piece of the tree into it, Wow. And then uncurl that thing onto a plate in front of you, or if you grab the bad one, in front of someone else's plate area, whatever. And you don't know what they are until you grab it, and as it spins up into you, you see what it is on the other side. In fact, sometimes it comes back too quickly and you miss it, so you have to kind of do a half blow to just kind of look at it. You know, you go... <laughs> And then it comes back. A half blow. I do those all blow. the time. It's a, it's a well-known gaming term right up there with <laughs> worker placement. So, Z, after one game of this, how wet are the components? Um, oh, it's certainly disgusting. There's no <laughs> denying that. But it is unique. 
I just don't I understand like, how you can, like, you know, this is, if they sold this today, it would have to be a legacy game. Nobody's going to reuse that thing, you know? <laughs> but they, they, I guess they meant for you to sanitize them and then use them again. <laughs> like I said, don't, don't, don't play this, folks. It's, it's COVID's out there. Don't invite COVID into your houses. I don't yeah. know that. I don't think COVID has anything to do with me not playing this. Yeah, what do you me, mean? me as well, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have done this before? Like, this is one of those games where the guy brings out and he says, don't worry, I sanitized this. And I'd go, no, you didn't. Not enough anyway. Well, there was an <laughs> expansion uh, called Operation Elephant in which you would play on teams. And so you would pass it back and forth <laughs> yeah, between no. the two of you. <laughs> well... I have a copy somewhere. Let me go. Let me get it. Hold on. I have a copy. Alex. You should have like just made it on a piece of paper, real yeah, quick. Yeah. Yeah. Doodle on a box. <laughs> anyway, Trotafon. Yeah, it's a weird one. I, um, I I couldn't even spell that when I went to Google it. Trotafon. You know what? Let's just move on because the further this game is in my past rather than my present, the better. Um, my you. number. My number six. Continuing my theme of games that I actually quite like but are also unique is from who for a long time and still may be my favorite designer, uh, the Czech Vlad Achvatil. And this is one of his older games, but I mean, frankly, a lot of Vlad's uh, catalog could be described as unique, but for the game I chose, well, actually, in fact, for the, my first Vlad game on this list, I went with Bunny, Bunny, Gal Moose, Moose. Galaxy Chucker. I could have said, well, see, oh, Bunny Bunny Moose Moose was something I genuinely considered for this list because yeah, that's the game of, Listening to a poem while trying to interpret maths while doing things with your fingers. Um, I went with Galaxy Trucker because I actually still like it, um, as opposed to Bunny Bunny Moose Moose. But Galaxy Trucker is a game about building um, sort of space trucks with sort of uh, square pieces way before. I mean, I suppose building using tiles to build out on a grid is is less unique now. But what is unique in Galaxy Trucker is then flying in a convoy with your constructs. And also an odd sense of cooperation. Galaxy Trucker is the only game I know where while you're all trying to make money, the manual says, so long as you made $1, you have considered to be a winner, which means actually almost all games of Galaxy Trucker, unless you go into debt, which is very possible, uh, everyone's a winner. But that's some trivia about Galaxy Trucker. Another bit of trivia about Galaxy Trucker, supposedly the entire game came to Vlada while he was in the shower and he was at a convention, ran out of the shower, <laughs> Um, with a towel around his waist and said to his uh, colleague at Czech Games, Philip, he was like, I've got it, or whatever, and just began writing down uh, the rough pitch for Galaxy Chucker. And apparently it was like, he went from not knowing the game to knowing the whole thing in the course of one shower, which if you believe it, as I do, certainly seals Vlada as a great designer. It's, that's why I spend so much time in the shower, waiting for that great idea. So still waiting for that, for that design to come to you, right? Yeah, I think I would have not told the story myself, but yeah, you know, you're right. There's a lot of these tile building games, but very few of them blow up all your hard work. Yes. Um, you know, so I, I could argue that for all the tile building games out there, I'm not sure any of them are as exciting as Galaxy Trucker, a game that came out, you know, what, 2007, 2008 or something. I'm mm. just thankful that we finally have somebody on the show who likes this amazing game. Yes, instead of all yes. The, I dislike all it. the hate. You don't know that, yeah, but, Quins, but I quite dislike this game. Goodness gracious. And never a chance of me ever... I, I put on a lot of top tens. So, all right, but not this one. Okay, uh, the next one is one of the newest ones on my list, and that is because I like making up currency, and that is QE. Mm. Um, so mine are actually going to get probably slightly less unique as we get higher because I like them more, and I tend to like, you know... The really, really weird ones are more of a, yeah, I played this once in a while, but QE, yeah, yeah. I love the fact that you can, you, you're bidding in an auction and you can bid any amount of money, any number that you can think of. And so if, you know, B could bid, bid 20, Quinn's bids a million, and I could say, you know what, 764 decillion, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we're in there now. But see, you could bid higher because we're just governments printing money. So what do we care? And the person who bids the most money over the course of the game loses. And I thought this game was broken when I first heard about it. In fact, I tried to break it when I played it. And yet it still works. I don't know why. I find it amusing. Um, 
I like that one player can drive everyone insane, just push the price up, and everyone just follows suit. You can't help yourself. You know, I, I watched huh. a couple games, and the high bid was like four hundred sixty-seven dollars. Forget that, four hundred sixty-seven <laughs> quadrillion should be a low bid. Every time you describe this game, I um, I don't know. I, I I'm less inclined to play because it sounds so annoying to have to deal with these large numbers for no good reason. It's like playing. You only have to deal with them if game. you're playing with. You me. know what I mean? Yeah, then, then you know, who else am I going to play with? I'm not going to cut you out of That's QE. That's true. You don't have many friends. I don't. But... And none, none of them would want to play QE. So, but it just sounds annoying. Again, it sounds like that whole fake large numbers on collectible card games. Like, this weird butterfly hits oh, yeah. for 4,000. It hits for four. Because there's never anything lower than 1,000. Yeah, you but in this game, there that is one. something lower than that. Yeah, but then don't be... I can't help myself. My goal is to bet a Google in this game at some point. So annoying. It sounds How very annoying. How many zeros I'll try is that? A Google's I mean, I, I, 100 zeros after it. If Oh, wow. I mean, like, I just hate counting generally. I've discovered that a lot of my dislike of really well like board games is how much counting is there? I don't think I'd like this because of all the zeros you have to count. Well, anyway, my number six, try. QE. All right. Number five. I kept going back and forth on this one. I'm not even sure why it ended up at five. And I'm not sure if you can call the game unique. This is Keyforge. It's my number Ooh. five. Ooh, Ooh, interesting. That's a good one. See, it's Keyforge is a, a fairly by the numbers deck build. I mean, not deck building, but like collectible card game, right? It's how, that's how that feels. But you can break up your deck. You, there's no deck building. You buy a deck and play it out of the box without messing with it whatsoever. And outside of that, there's a some sort of mythological machine out there that names and prints and builds these things and spits them out onto unsuspecting suckers who buy them up. It's so weird. I mean, I just... But I kept going sort of back and forth because the game experience isn't that strange. You know what I mean? The game itself is pretty outside the box. And they you know, don't really have anything else like it. Not so far. I, you know, no, nobody else, I think, is able to have the computing sort of know-how to make a, a unique deck card game in which every single deck has a weird, unique name, a weird, unique combination of cards, and they all work, you know? Do you folks know? I think this is a great, uh, a great uh, thing to have on the list. But um, do you know about the tournament format where you bring your worst randomized deck that you've found. And when you sit down with the, whoever you're Swiss against in the tournaments, you just trade decks with them. So your horrible oh. deck that you bring is what your opponent has to play with all day. I all love that. Super I have cool, not right? heard of that. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I, I really, really like that. that. I actually think the game does have a unique mechanism, though, with the fact that you can pick one of three factions and then that's what you can do stuff with and there's not i've not played anything like that everything's free as long as you pick that faction that turn yeah yeah and only the things that you picked activate also so there's that oh i don't really have a lot of cards to play from this one faction but my table has that those cards right i gotta get them to do something yeah i i, I suppose that's pretty uh different yeah, anyway, like I said, I sort of kept going back and forth with this one. But uh, I think it deserves a, a it deserves a mention when we're talking about weird outside-of-the-box games. Keyforge deserves a mention, I think. I, I couldn't agree more. I think if we'd finished this and it wasn't on any of our lists, I would be, like, slapping myself. My number five is not as good as Keyforge, but it is my second and final Vlada game on this list. And it has mechanics that are in common with a lot of games. And yet, when I say, no, it's <laughs> I, I give it a hint now. It's not and will never be Bunny Bunny Moose Moose because oh, man. I keep saying the games on this list are ones I actually like. And oh. the, the game is Space Alert. Okay, now Space Alert has programming. In, if you're not aware, it's a cooperative game where players, where either three or four players, I think, or four or five, 
run a small ship known as a sitting duck class vessel because it's basically Star Trek through the lens of sort of like incredibly crooked and corrupt USSR is the way to describe the space flight universe. You have to keep the ship alive for 10 minutes. This is a real time programming game where threats are dispensed by a CD that comes with the game, although now there's an app, I think. Um, and then it will say, you know, you'll be a minute into the game and it will say threat detected. Some will flip a card. The randomized threat could be a nuclear bomb that's been teleported onto your ship. It could be a slime. It could be any number of ships or asteroids or octopuses coming from the outside of the ship. And then players have to program their car, program their actions using cards. And then finally, once everyone's programmed all their stuff, you then resolve the game as if it was Robo Rally or something by resolving every step in sequence. But unlike Robo Rally, unlike other programming games, I've not played a programming game where everyone has to work perfectly in unison and in tandem. And you were talking about energy earlier, Z. Um, Captain Sonar has you know, some of the best energy in games. I think Space Alert has even better energy, mm. but it's also absolutely unique even today. And that's why it's my number five. Yeah, this is one that it just got by me just way back when it was out. I remember seeing it at local game stores and I just, I, 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 you know, I never picked it up. I never did play this one. It's one that I missed. I, I unfortunately missed. I'd be willing to give it a try. I love co-op games and you're right. This definitely sounds different. So I, honestly, I think not only do I think is it, it's aged well, I think it's still relevant today. I actually think playing space a lot, even as someone, I mean, because it's so unique, even as someone who's played a million games like yourself, I think if you played Space Alert, it would actually blow your mind a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah. Oh, also, you'd hate it, just to clarify. <laughs> I, I like it, but Z would hate it. Yeah, but right. I think, yeah, it's a good choice. My number five is our first crossover, finally. And it's with Z. What's your games? <laughs> it's not Trotopont. No, it's Witness. Uh, and if go. Twins had thought of it, it would have been a three way crossover. <sighs> So now we're making you feel doubly bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm just glad that Z said it first, so I used all my complimenting on him. Because uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Z already said everything I liked about the game. This actually made my list a few months ago about games you can't play in 2020. Where you <laughs> Let me whisper into your ear yes. here for a bit. Yes. Um, but... Yeah, I like I like the puzzle aspect of it. It's the kind of game that you think would be easier. Like, I just have to whisper one piece of information and then remember one more piece of information and whisper it. How hard could that be? The only problem I have with the witness is if you have one person at the table who is... I'm trying to think of a, a polite way to say this. A dumb... Go ahead. I'm not helping you. <laughs> One person can kind of throw the game off, I found. Somebody who can, who likes to reinterpret the truth. That's correct. They're like, that's what I heard. But uh, this is what I'm going to tell you. Yeah. But uh... I think what they meant to say was. Yeah. <laughs> my favorite, I, I, I hinted at it before, but my absolute favorite thing in Witness is when someone has been whispered something and they've clearly got it wrong or botched it and they know they've got it wrong or they can't remember it. They lean over and they whisper to you, like, he was tall or something. I d and, the, and he just gives you this garbage. Yes. And you're looking at him like, really? <laughs> like, okay, cool. I guess I'll go into the exam <laughs> section now. Yes. Yes, I've totally had that happen to me. Where somebody just says, like, something about his, he was talking about a hat or something. And then it, it was, there were colors on it. I don't know. Anyway, my guy wears a belt. And I'm like, great, thanks. <laughs> Glad you remembered your bit, you know? <laughs> anyway, fantastic game. I actually, I was thinking about this the other day. I really want to get it played again. So, witness. Number four. My number four used to be here above me. I moved it over there. My number four is a game uh, called Drop Mix. Drop Mix. Oh, okay. wow, that's true. From, uh, I guess, Hasbro, pretty sure. Drop Mix is this strange apparatus in... Uh, <laughs> strange apparatus. Uh, 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 I don't know why that's, that's what that sounded like in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's this uh, battery-operated, you know, uh, near-field reader. 
thing in which you on, onto which you play cards. The thing reads the card, and I'm talking, it's basically a cardboard card with a chip in it, and plays a piece of music. And and you will combine cards, and it sort of freeform makes music out of it. It doesn't always sound great, but the fact that this thing works, the fact that, like, I mean, it seems like 70% of the time you get some interesting jams out of it, and you can can play head to head you can play in teams head to head you can do a little party mode you can just sort of mess around with the cards that you will invariably end up doing because it's really fun it's so cool this is a bizarre thing and i haven't seen any other i haven't seen any other product that, that bridges the gap so well between toy and game not that this well See, that's what I was going to ask. Is this a game or is it a toy? I've not played it. It's a toy. It's not a game. It's a game. It's not a toy. Okay, it's I like don't know Uno who to believe. Game, though. It's not much of a game. It, the game it's is garbage. It's not much of a game. It's, a, it's, a, it's Uno, right? I mean, it's like that kind of game. It is clearly a game enhanced by a, a thing, a, a, you know, a, a modern uh, piece of equipment. It's like an app assisted game, if you would. That's kind of what it is. But you're right. It's not a great game, but it's really neat. It makes for a cool display. You know what I mean? You bring this thing out to just about anybody. I was going to say the uninitiated, but it's that's not true. You can bring this out to just about anybody. Press the button, start putting cards on it, and give them a deck of cards, and they their mind will be somewhat blown. The fact that this My thing works. My kids loved it. And My it only problem reads. I have with this game... Go ahead. I said, besides the fact that I don't like the game is that it's, it's out of print now. They stopped. It's gone. And they never came out with enough music that I liked. Like they, a lot of the music was very, very hip to now. And yeah. I would have liked more 60s, 70s music, 80s music. There just wasn't as much of that. Sure. No, I get that. I understand that. But um, the technology itself is, is cool. It's impressive. Uh, my number four is a game that is not as good a choice as Keyforge, but uh, I don't have a, as good of a mind as Z, apparently. Uh, but it is still a collectible card game, uh, and it is still published by Magic. Fantasy Flight. It's 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 Netrunner, isn't it? It's Netrunner, a.k.a. Android Netrunner, a.k.a. Richard Garfield's sequel, which supposedly solved all the problems to his design, Magic the Gathering. Now, um, Netrunner specifically is on my list for one mechanic. It's not on my list for the Cyberpunk theme, It's not on my, which is pretty unique. It's not on my list for the asymmetry, where one person plays a corporation, one person plays a hacker. It's on my list for the simple mechanic of, um, to, to win the game, the hacker has to acquire agendas, the corporation's secret plans. They do this by hacking, and the hacking is... Sort of by working their way through um, sort of firewalls and stuff deployed by the corporation to hack not just servers the corporation sets up and tries to protect, but they can hack the corporation's hand of cards, at which point you tunnel all the way through the server and then you pluck a card at random, you know, which is a mechanic we've seen. But you can also hack into the corporation's deck, which represents their R&D, their research. You can hack into their discard pile, all looking for these agenda cards, which um, are enormously important for both players. It's a bit of bluffing. It, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a shell game. It's bluffing, but it's also it's not bluffing because when the runner is trying to get into the deck, it's it's this magnificent moment where you can look into the person's deck, and even if you don't see an agenda, if you, even if you don't get any points, you can see the composition of their deck. You can see what cards they've got coming next. So even when you, it's got that just the marvelously simple thing. Even if you don't find what you're looking for, you get information. Uh, I mean, it's maybe not the most unique board game, certainly as compared to the ones uh, compared to games you two are mentioning, but among card games, among CCGs especially, Netrunner is unique, and it's also one of my absolute favorite games ever made. Yeah, I think you'd hit you know, the nail on the head when you said shell game. Netrunner, yeah, I've never heard it described that way, but absolutely, that's what it is. It's a shell game. Yeah. This is definitely the most unique of all the collectible card games. Uh, it's And it's managed to not be copied. You know, yeah. it's been out for ages, and I, no one's made anything like it, really. It's, you know, honestly, like, because it, it sold well at Fantasy Flight, but not enormously well. I mean, it, and it, it sold okay in the 90s when it first came out, but not enormously well. Honestly, I think, maybe this is unfair of me to say, but my gut says that collectible card game players, the, the Venn diagram of what they want, and then, you know, 
truly innovative and interesting card game mechanics is not it's not quite there <laughs> Um, the opinions of Quinn's are not reflective uh, opinions of the Dice Tower. I mean, I certainly don't want you to get dogged in the comments, but, you know, Netrun has come out twice. It's been amazing twice, and neither time it took off. I think we might have to admit that the market is not going to, like, pick it up in the way that it picks up stuff like Magic the Gathering or Keyforge. Well, for a moment, it was extremely popular uh, at that first Gen Con. But, yeah, I also think it's a hard, it's a difficult game to to do well at. You have to practice at it. You can't just throw cards and hope they do yes, well. Yes, it's yes, yes. It's an esoteric game, for sure. You have to build two different decks. You have to sort of learn <laughs> two games to play it. Yeah, yeah, it's different. Real fun, though, real fun. That's my number four, Netrunner. Nice. My number four yeah. is a game I don't believe that Z likes, but I think the innovation of this game adds to the theme of this one quite a bit, even if it isn't as precise as Z would prefer it to be. And that is Treasure Island, Ooh, okay. a game in which you are using an actual compass and actual tools to draw on a map to figure out where this conniving Long John Silver is. It's a game. It's a deduction game of sorts. But the way you use these measurement tools, I found to be extremely unique. Um, it just felt different and it did a really good job at giving this idea of you searching on a treasure map for buried treasure. I liked it a lot. Uh, Z, you were not a fan because of the fiddliness of it, right? Yeah, I guess so. But I agree with you that it is definitely distinct from any other social, not social deduction, but just deduction game or, you know, hide and seek mechanisms. Right, right. And it, it transcends that feeling of whatever you're supposed to be doing in the game. The game actually represents pretty well, you know, yeah. like the one to one of that comes through. So I'll give you that. I think it belongs on the list. I don't like it. No, I, 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 I just always any game that has a some element of imprecision bothers me. I, I like things to be exact. I don't like miniatures games. No, that I you told measure. you the rules. I keep telling you this all the time. The rules say that if the line is close, you're just supposed to say you got it. Oh, I, you know, I, I hate that. I hate everything about that rule. I love this game, but I'm with Z that, you know, like it uses circles, you know, you're trying to be precise, but you're searching with circles, which are by their nature completely imprecise because you'll never get the circle to cover. Like you want to fill the map with circles. It doesn't work. So, you know, there's, there's always a chance. <laughs> All right. We'll use a square next time, like a big stamp. I mean, stamp the board with a square. My hot take on this is that I love it being on the list for, you know, you, you're drawing big triangles, you're drawing circles, you're using rulers, the compass, all, all that's great. I don't know how good the game is. I would like, however, to see more games that use those tools, more compasses, more, you know, more, uh, you know, the, I don't know, all the all the cool cartography that you see people doing in movies. You know, there's no reason that shouldn't be in more board games because those yeah. those devices are really fun. Yeah. All right, I'll take it. Number Number four, Treasure Island. Number three. My number three is a crossover with Tom from earlier. Uh, More is, uh is my number I'm three, so Tom. I'm so surprised. Yes, yes. Uh, I almost put on the list. I, I sort of went back and forth between this one and Igloo Pop. <laughs> Igloo Pop being the other sort of very clear sound-driven one. Those two are like what comes to mind when I think of a game that uses sound. But I had too many. I, I sort of felt like I had too many kids games on the list as it was. I was like, all right, well, Morning Morosa is, is about murder. It's not really a kid's game. So, yeah, everything you said was right. We talked about it quite a bit. So I just I'll, I'll echo everything you said. This is really outside the box. And uh, yeah, if you can find it, give it a try. If you do, Igloo Pop, I almost picked it also. Yeah. If you two are such fans of games that involve sound, have you heard of a game called Woodlouse Chaos? It's part of the Ugly Animals series that includes Cockroach Poker. It's uh, It's got this crazy thing where you, you take turns, when it's your turn, you look at a card that might have like three spiders. And then you, depending on where spiders are in the row of animals that's randomized, the fact there's three spiders means you have to clap three times. If the spider is like fourth in the row, you have to slap the table four times. But you're doing this trying to trip up all the other players. So you might, I'm going to, I can't do this on my mic, but you'll do like clap, bam, clap, bam, clap, bam, clap, clap, or like whatever. And you try and do it fast enough when players aren't expecting it to try and give this information in a way that they can't remember what you just did. It's interesting. And if I knew 
the angle that you two were taking, I would have included it on my list, but that's Woodlouse Chaos. Huh. Uh, my actual number three is... I'm buying this right now. Woodlouse Chaos. It's great. I, I collect all those Ugly Animals games. I think they're all good. God, why is Cheating Moth not on my list? Anyway. Yeah, I'll that's stick a with funny the... one. That's, that's, that's crazy where you have to just get rid of your cards however you can. So yeah. you throw them under the table, put them up your sleeve or whatever. Yeah, that's the best. Yeah, uh, fantastic convention game. Instead, my number three was Space Cadets by Jeff Engelstein. Space Cadets is bizarre and definitely unique. Um, it is a game where all the players represent the crew of a Star Trek style ship. You can have a captain, you've got, you know, uh, an engineer, you've got a communications officer, but all of these people are playing different mini games. So like the sensors person is reaching into a bag to try and feel certain shapes and pull them out. All of these games are played in real time at the same time, by the way. The, sh the shields officer is trying to make poker hands by flipping tiles, then assign them to different directions. The driver is playing like a programming game. Um, but what's insane about all of this stuff is that you're all, you, the, to pilot the ship well, you all have to work in perfect sync. But all of your mini games are so hard that, you know, you're attacking a monster or a space creature. So the shield guy tries to put shields on front, but then the driver accidentally turns left and then the weapons guy shoots in the wrong direction and you didn't get a sensor lock anyway. Uh, there's even when your ship takes damage, there's a card that forces everyone to change locations. So everyone has to stand up around the table and walk to a different mini game, which is really fun if you haven't taught that player that mini game in the rules explanation. <laughs> yes, that's, I hate that card so much. <laughs> um, but this is certainly a unique game. This is Space Cadets, my number three. Yeah, the reason this one is not on my best of games list, I mean, I loved it. I learned it. I said, this is fantastic. I love the mini games. And about the fourth time I taught it, I was done. Yeah. Because it was just so much work. And then you'd finish and someone would go, I got it. I know how to do my station. And be like, time to change spots. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot to learn. This game is not in my collection anymore, which probably means it shouldn't be on my list. But hey, nah, whatever. Nah, no. Yeah. My number three is another pirate game, and that is World of Yoho. Yeah. Now I still have not seen another game like this. Um, the World of Yoho. I think I have this the right name of it. I oh, I just call it Yoho all the time. So, um, but anyhow. Great, yeah. In this game, you are using your phone as your ship. It shows you the ship on your screen, and you put it on this map, and you'll move it around the map on your turn doing different actions, and it shows you what's on the map on your screen. And even if you fight somebody else, sometimes you'll get to someone else, and you'll shoot at their ship. If you go to a port, you'll pick your phone up, and you'll work on the little selling and trading and stuff, and it's... It's almost more video game than it is board game, but you actually are using the board out there, moving the ship around. Yeah. The problem with World of Yoho, there's several. One, all the phones need to be on the internet and on the same one. Two, they're running full battery power the whole time. Three, that guy who's always trying to text is really annoyed about the whole thing because <laughs> you're using his phone as part of the game. And four... When you pick it up and you do the little selling and stuff, that slows the game down a little bit. Yet despite all those problems, this game fascinates me. And I want to play it more often than not just because it's so different than everything else. Yeah. yeah speaking of games that are cool tech demos like uh, Drop Mix is, this, this one, World of Yoho, is definitely one of those games where you can just tell players, okay, go here, put your phone on the table. And then it uses the accelerometer in your phone to when you move from one location to the next spot, the map sort of shifts under it. So you, you think that your phone basically becomes a piece of glass and it's wow. just the coolest. I mean, lots of blown minds as I showed this off to the family. It's, it's wow. neat. Yeah. And the one thing you didn't mention, Tom, when you go, when you shoot at somebody else, you have the cannonball leave your phone and enter their screen. <laughs> Remember that? That's super satisfying. That is the I don't coolest know what it is. thing. I love that. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if you could get it, I mean, you, it's basically just an app you download, and then there's a, you buy a box with a map in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, World of Yoho. <laughs> 
number two. All right, my number two isn't particularly bizarre. I feel like many of my other ones are, are weirder than this, but I really like the game. And it's a, um, it's a deduction game called the Shipwreck Arcana. Oh, really? Yeah, and this one is... The, the thing I really like about it, it's a... Like I said, it's a deduction game, but I, I like that it is not one grand search for the truth, like many deduction games. It doesn't use the clue sort of model of deduction in which some piece of information is missing. You spend the entirety of the game to find that answer. This gives you one small search on every player's turn. The way it works is you pull out a couple of tokens from a bag. You look at the two tokens. They're numbered between one and seven, I think it is. And then you take one of the two and you put it on a card out on the table. You keep the other one, the, the other one uh, hidden. And the cards have things like, oh, if you have, if both of your tokens are odd, put the higher numbered one here. So if you went there, the players around the table go, okay, well, the other number is also odd. It's lower than that one. It could be this or it could be that. If it had been this number, he would have put it over here instead. So it's got to be the five. Whatever, right? It's this little sort of mini deduction rounds in succession around the table. And I just find it captivating. It's a tiny little package. It is so fun. The me mental gymnastics are so entertaining. It's co-op. I really like this one a lot. So I just haven't seen anything quite like it. Shipwreck, Arcana. I don't think I played this one. I think you'd like it for sure. <clears throat> my number two is uh, unusual, and you two are going to say, what the heck? And I'm going to say, well, I'm, I'm going to say exactly what I'm saying right now. My number two is, believe it or not, Tigris and Euphrates. Now, come on, man. Right, here we go. Here we go. See, see, that's what I said. But here's, here's my pitch. So I teach a lot of board games, as you two do. Tigris and Euphrates is, on the surface, the most, the least unique thing. It's a board covered in a grid. It's some tiles. It's set in ancient Mesopotamia or Babylon or whatever. Um, these things are incredibly dry. It's about civilizations rising and falling. And yet, I teach Tigris and Euphrates at this point. I've taught it to a lot of people who've played hundreds, if not thousands, of board games. And teaching this game is still a nightmare because this <laughs> yes, game is. is so unique in how in the, the rules of it. It's not been replicated. It's not been duplicated. Unless, I mean, technically, this this entry is invalidated by yellow and yangtze made by the same, well, designer. same designer it doesn't count yeah 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 but um tigris and euphrates simply doesn't play like anything else and it's on my list because it is one of my favorite games so if we're talking about top unique games it's in there um but it's also on my list because i think it's it's its uniqueness stands out for how generic the rest of it is you know like right. it even though it's so generic even though it uses elements we've seen before teaching it is still a huge pain in the bum because it is so unique. It simply doesn't think the same way other board games do. That's my number two, Tigris and Euphrates. Hmm. Very I actually the... thought about this one. Uh, oh, no, did you? Because I think, well, it is, there's no game like it. I mean, other than Yellow and Yangtze. No one's tried to make it. I I feel like it's it's uncopyable. Even, I mean, even if we take it to a simple element, like the way that players are all building cities, but no one owns them, but you can kind of own aspects of them for a bit. Like, it, it's not just that no one's tried to do Tigris and Euphrates. There's like three or four things in the game that how it's built that simply have never been used, to, well, that yeah. simply never really entered like the popular consciousness, which is so bizarre to me. It's almost like it's scared off other designers. Yeah, I think the one thing everybody stole from this game and a couple of other Kanitsia games was the, the scoring. Everybody took the scoring. You know, collect yeah, four different kinds of cubes, you score the lowest of the four. But the mechanisms, yeah, I think you're right. That that idea of building something together, inner conflict, outer conflict, and, and owning ideas in something you're constructing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's 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 a cool one. Hmm. Cool. That's my number two. All right, my number two, I actually have well, I'm not reaching up, it's too high. I just got the new <laughs> version of this game. And I'm really excited because it finally doesn't look like a boring piece of trash. And that's Sidereal Confluence. Uh, okay. 
So, scenario confluence. <laughs> that sounded loaded. I can't wait to hear this. Go ahead, Tom. I'm going to sit back. Look, scenario confluence, first of all, has a unique theme, I think, in that you're all trying to achieve oneness of some sort of. I, I, I can't actually explain it because I'm not high enough to understand it. <laughs> but this game is an engine building game of which there's a gazillion, but the way it mixes engine building and negotiation and does not allow you essentially to use your own stuff to help you. Uh, I just found it to be so different than everything else out there. It's unique that you need a lot of players to make it work. It takes a lot of time. It needs that perfect setting, but I just, I've not seen anything like it. And the pictures that we're showing you here make it look even more boring than that. Um, fortunately, the new version from WizKids is phenomenal. It's, it's a twice as good looking, but... Oh, more than twice. More than twice, for sure. Oh, oh you sorry. Like you could, oh, wait. I, no. I'm not looking at the picture. No, I'm waiting for I the just... shoe to drop here. Quins, do you hate this game? Uh, no, I do not hate it. The reason I went, mm, okay, and I feel bad doing this because you two have been so kind about some of my choices, but... Oh, that's uh, never stopped anyone. Come on now. Okay, okay. Here Let we go. Here have we go. it. Sidereal is, you said it yourself, it's an engine building game. There are a million of them. And by the way, I love Sidereal, but it's an incredibly no-frills engine building game and also an incredibly no-frills negotiation game. It just, it just... The fact that it puts the two of them together and balances it, and Lord knows it was years of work from the designer. And I think Sidereal is amazing. But it's like, it as compared to all the other games the three of us have mentioned, Sidereal is just two things we've seen before, you know, welded together. So, But the I, welding is unique. Sure. And the welding was a ton of work from the designer to get it all balanced. So, yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know, Tom. Maybe I just expected more from you at number two. <laughs> Well, just like my dad, I'll disappoint you too. <laughs> oh my. Sorry. And finally, number one. It's exciting. Da, 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 da. Number one, it's gotta be good. I don't know if um <laughs> I don't think there's going to be any more crossovers at this point. I uh, any idea what this might be, Tom? Because you know me a little bit better. It's nothing uh, that's already... been mentioned. This can't be that stupid bear carrying honeypots. No, it's that's not, not original. Unique anyway. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Is um, it the sequel no. to Truffle Stuffle? It's, it's Truffle not Shuffle. a. Uh, it's not a kids <laughs> game. It is, there's been sort of like a vein of deduction type games. And this one is sort of like that. It's about figuring something out. And then it's like Exit. Unlock. No, but those are all interesting, I think. Interesting choices. No, it's this not is. Escape from the Aliens and Outer Space. Ooh, that might be Tom's pick, actually. No, my number one is Zendo. Zendo is my name. Oh, I do. You know, you thought I hated Sidereal. I do hate Zendo. Oh, no. That's okay. okay. Zendo is... <laughs> That's it's okay. Such a, it's you a really... It. It's a weird... activity slash... you know, sort of like co cognitive exercise... It's not a, it's definitely the kind of game that is I, I will not bring out at most events. Like I mean it has to be a really specific evening with a really specific sort of vibe and ambiance for me to go, yeah, I think Zendo would work right now. Cuz this absolutely is one of those games that can kill the mood dead like nothing else, right? But when the time is right, when the people are interested in doing this kind of activity, Setting up a little puzzle and having everybody sit around quietly sort of trying to figure out what the answer is. Why this one combination of little pyramids follows some made-up rule in my mind, but yet this one doesn't. And then they build something and they go, what about this one? Does that follow the rule? And I go, yes, it does. And they're like, ooh, I think I, I think I know what it is. Or somebody else says it does when I go, no, but this one does. And I build another one that does. I don't know. I love that emerging picture. You know what I mean? 
It's so fascinating, uh, uh, and and nothing's quite like it. I mean, this is definitely I, the the unique aspect of the list is I think certainly served by this, and I like the game. Yeah, so uh, Zendo. So without wanting to stunt on you, Z, uh, and my, because uh, goodness knows when I'll appear on the Dice Tower again. When you say there's nothing else that's like it, um, we did a series on Shut Up and Sit Down last year called Card Games That Don't Suck, which was games you can play with a 52 card deck. And okay. uh, one of our interns at the time, Kylie, discovered a card game from I think the 70s or 80s called Eleusis, E L E U S I S. And Eleusis is competitive Zendo played with a deck of cards with a bunch of other wacky stuff going on um okay. but it's it's similar that one person decides on a logic rule um but then other players are scientists who sort of have to play cards and then th play cards that they think follow the rule because it's a hand shedding game or, or you're trying to get point i forget but at some point if one if, <laughs> if it's a at some point a player around the table can decide that they're a prophet and then say actually i know the rule and put their card down and they become a prophet of god and god is the person who came up with the rule anyway um I, I don't want to get sidetracked, but Eleusis uh, is a way to play Zendo with a 52 card deck that I actually prefer to Zendo. Um, okay. But it's not something the board game community knows about because as far as I can tell, if it involves a 52 card deck, uh, no one's interested. Um, right. But yeah, that's Eleusis. It's fascinating. I actually considered Zendo Z and dismissed it for a similar reason because I played a game from ancient Egypt. No, but um, <laughs> no, but I... This has been a parlor game for a long time. So that's why I, I, I don't know. That's just why I discounted it. Because yeah, yeah, I can we used see to play that. like, what's a weeble? And then you would list some things. And after a while, you're like, oh, a weeble is something that starts with the letter S or whatever it might be. Okay, I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I find it um, being contained in a box, being sold with rules, having a little sort of more concrete, you know, it, it's... It uh, legitimizes the activity a little more for me. You know what I mean? I agree. There's yeah, that. Yeah, I like it. 52 cards like is it. trash. <laughs> agree. Agree. Uh, Absolute tell you, garbage. Tell you what's trash. It's my number one. Now, my number one is, I think, it's like my number two, Tigris and Euphrates. I think I'm going to say this, and you two are initially going to go, what? Um, but then hopefully I'll bring you around to my way of thinking. And again, this has got uh, to I'm prepping. Here we go. You ready, Tom? Uh -huh. it's, cos it's Cosmic Encounter. I'm conflicted. Okay, so <laughs> here's my pitch. Um, we have all played Cosmic to death. We all know Cosmic. We're, we we know we know Cosmic back to front. Um, and if people out there haven't seen Cosmic Encounter or don't know what it is, then goodness, I would certainly encourage them to Google it. For a long time, it was um, my and Tom's favorite game of all time. But Cosmic Encounter, if you detach yourself from everything you know about it, is absolutely unique i think you know never mind the fact that every game is unique based on the array of alien races it's like tigris and euphrates have you ever when was the last time you tried to teach someone cosmic even if they've played a load of board games it's bizarre it's got all of these mechanics that are built into the deck that you have to know are coming like warp tubes or you know the single co you know cosmics or cards app and the cosmic apps plague um it's a bizarre thing to teach it is what is it it's a, a war it's an asymmetric war game hand management game with negotiation and alliances it's also a take that card game but also could be any other genre depending on the aliens that have been shuffled into you into that's the game true. that's true um and really this me putting this on the list is just catharsis because it justifies why I love Cosmic so much, but I've had such a hard time introducing it to my friends because teaching it is such a nightmare because it's so unique. So that's my number one Cosmic Encounter. This is actually one game I feel like I'm really good at teaching. I I, I think it's because I have to do it at every convention. Oh, really? So you, get, you know, after the... Uh, man, I don't know. You're right. I mean, I mean whether, you're, whether you're good at teaching it or bad at teaching it, I think, Tom, you and I can both agree this is a garbage pick. <laughs> no, I'm, well, I don't know. I'm kidding, like, let's kidding. say this is good. it this depends is good. what we like. If we did this list in 1980, this is going to be number one on all of our lists. Um, well, it sort of it, it brings to question. It brings to the, the question to the table of you know, if something inspired a bunch of other stuff. Is that original thing still unique? You know what I mean. But what did Cosmic ins like? What would you say magic. That Cosmic inspired? Well, definitely inspired Magic the Gathering. Okay. I had actually never made that connection before. Well, Richard Garfield said it, so must I mean he could have been lying. <laughs> that um, would be hilarious. 
And he was just lying about that. And yeah. Um, <laughs> like, there's like, there's no reason to be. No, I. I it's. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think the, the fact that not. About serial confluence. Oh my goodness! Is that why magic has twenty health? Because cosmic gives you twenty ships. Well, that I don't yes. know. That's exactly. <laughs> Well, if we had oh. a record scratch, we'd play it right now. But... Oh, my goodness. I really <laughs> hope that's true. Goodness me, I hope that's true. All right, Tom, what is your what is your? I was one pick? correct. Is... I said two crossovers, and I have two crossovers, but the second one is not with Z. Look at that. Is it Cosmic? Oh, you're going to justify my bad list? Let's go. Tell me it's it is. That would be great. It is. It would be funny if it was Cosmic. Wait, now, no, hang on. Captain... Let me guess. Let me guess. Oh, you said it. Captain Sonar. <laughs> Captain Sonar. Um, and again, I'm not ordering these as most unique, because I think some of the other ones on my list are more unique than Captain Sonar, but there's no other game I've played like it, with the possible exception of the sequel to Space Cadets, Space Alert. There were some similarities, I thought, between those. But Wait, did you just say the sequel, to the sequel of Space Cadets was Space Alert? No, Space Cadets, not Space Alert. Space, um, Space, Space Cadets, Dice, Dice Duel? Duel? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about Dice Duel. Forgot about Dice Duel. That, that has some would have similarities. Captain Sonar, yeah. Well, no, yeah. no, 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 no. You're right. Because if you're wrong, I'm wrong, and that's problematic. Okay. Um, I love the idea of a cooperative, simultaneous battleship mixed with deduction, mixed with these other stuff. And for some reason, it works. And you know, you said you don't like playing at conventions, but I, that's my favorite place to play it. Yeah, I, I think it's only because. If conventions are loud, I mean, really, it's it's fine so long as your group is louder than the convention around you. That's, which that's how it works. It play fun, it yeah. right next to the people playing Tigers and Euphrates, and it's a win win <laughs> for everybody. Nice. <laughs> Let me teach you this game. It's called Tigers and Euphrates. Guys, can you keep it down? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yes, I've been at both sides of that situation before. I've been at the loud table. And at the table next to the loud table. <laughs> Have you ever tried to teach any game within 30 feet of Happy Salmon? It's just not happening. Uh, futility right there. We uh, we went to a Danish convention called Festival, and um, there was a point in the day where the like sort of restaurant area became a nightclub, and and we were we were like an hour into a game of Gugong. We only had like 15 minutes left. And then we got to the final 15 minutes of Gugong, a medium heavy euro with just pounding music and what score did you get 17 and it was worse than any convention but funnier destroyed my voice though <laughs> all right let's see what the people said so i put up a poll on facebook to see what everyone would say and this is obviously going to be i guess less unique since more people are saying it if that makes sense but uh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten here we go number ten they said galaxy trucker oh that's a point for quinn's all right, number nine, Quacks of Quedlingburg. No, that's a bad guess from your audience. I'm just getting in there. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. in your audience, too. I don't think there's... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> if they're wrong, they're our guys, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number eight, Magic Maze. Yeah, okay, except Magic that's... Maze on Mars, but yeah. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. come on now. The Magic Maze. Right, <laughs> no. Seven, The Crew. Yeah. I thought about the crew, but the crew is definitely um, good enough to be on my list. And well, that's true. Feels very strange. Yeah. And the crew's a great Number guess. five was photosynthesis. That's interesting. It's There's got like okay. one, it's got one really sort of weirdly thematic mechanism, right? That whole shadow thing. When you first learn it, you're like, ah, oh. mm -hmm. but I don't know if that makes the game. Unique. So we're just jumping all over our audience. All right, number four, <laughs> the mind. Yeah, well, it's kind of like it's like it's a sort of a theater game, right? You know, I don't know if you two ever did this at school, but anyway, <laughs> just belittling all the audience guesses is no good. <laughs> Welcome to the dice tower. Number three, dice forge. Sure. I mean, yeah. Until another game uses dice, where you change the sides. There's a couple, but but they're 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 few and far between. Number two, Chronicles of Crime. I actually considered that, but the problem is is that it's using tech 
to add to, you know, basically stuff like Sherlock yeah. Holmes Consulting Detective and other things. So it's not necessarily unique. It's just better. Yeah. It's, just modern, you mean? You don't consider that to just be unique because it's instituting just something now available? I guess. I don't know. I, I feel like this is a very ambiguous list and we could argue over it all day long, right? We didn't even establish our terms of whether most top unique means best unique games. I'm still I'm still thrown by that. Uh, what's very, what's number very, one very from unique. the people was Captain Sonar. No. 249 votes. Chronicles Crime only got 178. So there's a big, wow. a big jump there. But almost every game we mentioned... Well, almost every game that me and Quinn's mentioned was on this list. There's Root. Um, the ones that Z mentioned, no one has ever played. Other <laughs> There's than no the, the guy who designed right, the game. Fine. You know what? Fine, fine. I get it. You know, somebody didn't put uh, Captain Sonar on their list. Well, guess <laughs> what? As we, as the ever true rule stands, Tom, it's my number 11. No, actually, you would say that it, you're being ultimate, unique not putting it on your list. The ultimate escape is that it's my number 11. I oh, want. Man, I I'm I'm coming away from this mostly realizing that I want to play this weird ten floor hotel game that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> Mord M Arosa. Yeah. Mord M Arosa. This. I, so, I really I, this, this has restoration games reprinted. written all over it, right? <laughs> yeah. That would be a cool pickup from somebody else. And restoration, uh, yeah, could do that. Hey, uh, uh, I feel like Capstone. Are, getting some weird stuff these days i think like, you know capstone did the climbers as well as all those heavy euro games this, I would, actually, see this would work for renegade because they've done those cat stacking ones sure that's true they could, could they could definitely put a like a oh it, actually the art on mortimerosa looks like um the artist that tim farris works with ah yeah uh whose name well anyway yeah. That's <laughs> our top 10 unique games. If you're watching this later on, let us know in the comments what you think. What are some cool, unique games? And um, we'll, t we'll thank you, Quinns, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thank you so Check much for having me. Check out his channel, the very well-known Shut and Sit Down. You all already watched it anyway. Uh, they just posted a review of Eclipse. Eclipse, so, second edition. It's good. I liked it. It's a very good board game. It's too expensive, though. Oh, there and you go. You don't, don't have to go watch it now. <laughs> ah, Tom. <laughs> You're not supposed to spoil it. You're supposed to be. I'm trying. I'm vague. trying to be unique over here. <laughs> this was so well, much fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you, man. This was good. Anyway, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Thank you. I mean, do I say my name? Because I'm I'm you not going to be back next to. time. I'm Quinns. Have fun being unique. I'd be back.